May I have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? My name is Son of, Son of Yeshua, Abel, Deacon Yeshua. I'd like to serve you as a priest starting very soon. It's now time to start finding your seats for Sabbath services. It's my privilege and honor to introduce the first speaker, Ben Alexander Hawkins. Shabbat shalom, everyone. You can be seated. In the PCR, you each and every one of you. The title of my speech is The Requirements to be a Teacher of Righteousness. We must be teachers of righteousness. Pastor is one. Yeshua is one. Yeshua is already perfect. He is in Yahweh Shema getting ready for us to come up. We will soon sit at the marriage supper, and after that, we will teach the people on the other worlds. Being teachers of righteousness is very great. To be a teacher of righteousness, we must know what righteousness is. Please turn to Deuteronomy 6.25 on page 153. And it says, and it will be our righteousness if we observe to do all this law before you are our Father as he has commanded us. We will get rewarded if we do righteousness and become teachers. Some of the rewards for making it into the kingdom are having the powers over the microbes and not getting burned up by all the bombs. Teachers of righteousness do not teach foolishness, nor do they teach God worship. They teach righteousness always and all the time. <laughs> Teachers of righteousness are righteous because they learn what to teach, then teach what they've learned only at the established house of power. Please turn to Isaiah 2.4 on page 531. And it says, he will judge among the nations and will rebuke many people. And there will be the swords and the plashes and spears and the pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither will they, neither will they learn war anymore. In the seventh book of Israel, part one, chapter four. In the seventh book of Israel, part one, chapter four. Verse 80. And it says, Remember the Deuteronomy and the Timothy. Remember those. You know you've got to have these. You've got to have the righteous teachers, the righteous judges, and they've got to be strict with Yahweh's laws. That's the reason you've got to be strict. That's the reason you've got to all become teachers of righteousness. You've got to become Melchizedek. They are kind, they love people, they help people in things. This is an example shown by a great overseer. They do not murder and they do not sin. These are a few positive character traits that a teacher of righteousness has. 
honest, kind, loving, obeying the priests and other authorities that are in charge of them. Pastor is just one of the people that is in charge of everyone in the house of Yahweh. He has appointed other authorities that we must also listen and learn from. They are righteous teachers. In the seventh book of Israel, part one, chapter three, verse 72, says, um, it says, but with this book now and with your teachers, with the teachers over tens, over fifties, over hundreds, you know, the teachers, that's the teachers are going to make the difference. Become a teacher so you can make the difference. It's very important that you do learn to teach and you, the only way you're going to learn to teach is to be taught how to teach at Abilene, of course. We should all love pastor because pastor is teaching us to be like Yahweh. If we follow his example, we will learn what to teach and fulfill the requirements of being a teacher of righteousness. Can you all bless our understanding? And I would now like to turn it over to the next speaker. Come see last six ministries of the Poppins, the Ashim Messiah. Father Yara, thank you for everything you've given us. I thank for your food and drink, Father. In Jim Messiah's name, how you have Last stop. Please be seated.
Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Please be seated for a few announcements. Attention all who put in work orders. When you put in a work order lawfully at the South Office, if you have any questions or instructions, please go to the lawful place. Do not approach the worker, even if you know who it is. Enjoy your takeout dinner and supper today at the Lamplight Cafeteria. We will serve Abel's barbecue chicken for dinner. Lamplight Cafeteria will open after services and close at 5.30 p.m. Please pick up worker meals between 5 and 5.30 p.m. That's all the announcements. If you all please stand, we'll go ahead and have opening prayer shortly. Please raise your hands for opening prayer. Holy Father Yahweh, this is Deacon Yeshua and Time with Bicons, Pastor Joe Hawkins, and she's named to pray. Please allow us to take in all this knowledge from the speakers today and that we use in our daily lives. And please, as Pastor, if I will for you, this kind of my connection. Please, as kind of did it, he may be released from prison and all the others who are suffering in the prisons. Please make us who he wants to be, because that's who we want to be in your eyes, for family. Please allow us that we'd have no stress over us and that you'd always be with us wherever we go. Ask all your things to the Viacons, Pastor Hawkins, and your shoes name to pray. Oh, yeah, I praise you. Heavenly Father Yahweh, this is your servant, Kohan David Hawkins, coming to you in unity with the priest of the house of Yahweh through your last day's witness and servant, the great Kohan Yisrael Abel Hawkins, and through a great high priest, Yeshua. As the smoke of this incense arises here from the sanctuary of the great house of Yahweh, it arises with our prayers of those gathered here and the prayers of all your saints gathered throughout the world at this time, those who whom you have called out of this world to, to, uh, and inspired to, to listen to and learn from your last day's witness, the great Kohan, Yisrael Abel Hawkins. He is Moshe in this generation. He's uh, Yahshua in Yahshua's generation. He is your last day's witness uh, in these last days. And uh, we do uh, follow his, uh, his guidance, which is uh, guided and directed by your spirit, which is holy. We... We serve you through uh, Yahshua and through him, and uh, we ask your blessings upon your last day's witness and each and every one of us in, in overcoming and, uh, and being part of your work in these last days. ask that you bless our health, that we may serve you and serve you abundantly, and uh, we just praise you and thank you for calling out of this world. Truly, you are merciful to us in doing this, and we love you, we thank you, we praise you, and ask for your blessings in Yeshua's name as the seed of the witness Israel. Hallelujah, Yahweh. At this time, it's a privilege and honor to turn it over to the first speaker, son of Israel Abel, Nian Arsamont. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Please be seated. The title of my speech is War Will Never Bring Peace. If you turn over to Matithia 24 on page 752, Matithia 24, 7 and 14, and it says, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and disease epidemics and, earthquake and, and earthquakes in place after place. And looking down at verse 14, it says, And this message of the kingdom will be preached to all the world by the one who bears witness to all nations, then the end will come. Yahweh has given mankind 6,000 years to see that war will only bring sickness, diseases, and death. You can see in the news that nations are rising against one another. There's the United States, Iran, North Korea, China, and Russia, Russia and India fighting, whether it is verbal or physical. 
Looking in history, we could see this same pattern with the Vietnam War, Cold War, Korean War, and starting on September 12, 2006, World War III. And today there is more than 40 wars going on. And people in the world think that these things will protect them. But Pastor has taught us that weapons and bunkers will not keep them safe. If you turn over to Psalms 91, 1 through 10, on page 470. Psalms 91. says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We say to you, Yahweh, you are our refuge and our fortress. You are our Father and you we will trust. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and deadly pestilences. Pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you would trust. His truth will be your shield and buckler. You will not be afraid of the terror of night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand will fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Only with your eyes you will look and you will see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made Yahweh your refuge, because you have made the Most High your house, the house of Yahweh, no evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your, dwell, your dwelling. So if you keep Yahweh's laws, this man with the laws of Yahweh can save you. So praise Yahweh for him. And you put praise Yahweh in the MA Trinity equals 828. If you turn over to Eremia 11, 3 and 4 on page 582, Eremia 11, 3 and 4, it says, And say to them, This is what Yahweh, the Father of Israel, says, Cursed is the man who does not obey the law of, laws of this covenant, which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them out of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice and do them exactly as I command you and you will be my people, and I will be your father. So if we obey Yahweh's word given to us by Israel Hawkins, we will live. And wars are not always between nations. Wars can be in our homes, in schools, or as we see right now, fighting in the streets. And the only way that we cannot have nuclear war is if the whole world repented. But sadly, that will not occur. Only two billion people will be saved from the soon coming nuclear destruction. Please turn over to Colossians 2, 16 and 17 on page 926. Verse 16 says, Therefore, let no man condemn you for doing these things, eating and drinking in the observance of a feast day, or of a new moon, or of a Sabbath, which are a shadow from things to come from the body of Messiah. So if we keep the Sabbaths and feast properly, we'll abide under the shadow that Psalms 91 talks about. So in conclusion, remember, do not put your trust in weapons or bunkers because he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. And your only, your only trust is in Yahweh, his house, and his laws. And with that, I'll turn it over to future priest, son of visual labor, Deacon Obama. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Please be seated. The peace of the hour be with each and every one of you. We can start over by turning in our book to Yahweh to page 938. Page 938, you find... Uh, the book of 2 Tamiah, chapter 3, and we'll read from verse 1. And you can see the, the sub, subtitle right there says, In the Last Days. It says, Know this also, that in the last days perilous times will come. Then verse 2, For men will be lovers of themselves. And it goes on to, to uh, mention all these negative character traits that are going to be present in the last days. Skip over to verse 4. It says, traitors, headstrong, arrogant, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of Yahweh. 
So as you can see there, uh, in the last days, men are going, are going to be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of Yahweh. So to take man's mind away from Yahweh and what they should be working on, Satan has devised a very clever tool that blunts the perception of man to where they can't even figure out what's right from what is wrong. Which leads me to my, ter- to, to my title, Fake Relief. And I'm going to be focusing on the issue of drug abuse. Most of my information is from the booklet, Drugs and Drinking, What Do the Scriptures Really Teach? So, what is a drug? From the American Heritage Dictionary, the word drug means a chemical substance such as a narcotic or hallucinogen that affects the central nervous system, causing changes in behavior and often causing addiction. I'd like to read from this book called The Mind, a book called The Mind by Dr. Richard, starting from, verse, uh, from page 105. He says, throughout history, human beings have been conducting uncontrolled experiment on the mind. They have used and often abused substances capable of acting on the brain to produce pleasure. Remember, as we read in uh, 2 Demeyer 3, verse, uh, verse 4, that pleasure, to produce pleasure so overwhelming that the mind is wholly concentrated is in attaining this pleasure. It becomes the motivating force in their lives, more important than food, companionship, safety, even life itself. So have that in mind, you know. When the two billion people get here, they're not, they're not going to drop all their problems and show up here. They're going to have to deal with these things. People who are going to be more concerned about, about pleasure than even food, companionship, safety, even their life. And he goes on to say that drug taking is also found worldwide. It exists in every culture. Today, in addition to these natural, naturally occurring substances like marijuana and, and uh, opium, the plant-related substances, there are a wide variety of synthetic drugs. Among them are prescription sedatives, barbiturates, amphetamines, and mood-altering medications such as tranquilizers, whose potential for abuse is also often exploited. When we talk about the potential for abuse, we mean that a substance has the capacity to induce dependence in those who use it, whatever they need, whatever they need could be. So it mentions two things. So first is the intense pleasure these substances arouse. That's the first one. And number two is the blocking out of rea- the reality that the user, the user of the drug, usually finds frightening, disturbing, or in some other ways is unendurable. Authorities make a distinction between, uh, in the drugs, they make a distinction between physical dependence on the drugs or psychological dependence. Psychological dependence on the drug is a form of obsessive behavior whose objective is the attainment of pleasure or the avoidance of unpleasantness. On the other hand, physical dependence, is, which is technically, technically termed addiction, occurs when the brain itself becomes so biochemically changed to where the uh, to where the body relies on it for it to uh, function properly. It becomes so biochemically changed because of the continual consumption of the drug. Okay? Because of this biochemical changes in the brain function, an abrupt stopping of the drug causes acute physical and mental symptoms, which we know as the withdrawal syndrome. In 1 Corinthians, you don't have to turn there. First Corinthians, real quick. Chapter 6 and verse 12, under the uh, subtitle, Glorify Yahweh in your own body, it says, uh, All awful things are permissible for me, but not all things are advantageous. All awful things are permissible for me, but I will not be overpowered by any of them. So, uh, back to the, back to the, to the, the booklet. You can, we find this, an excerpt from the book, from, uh, from the book uh, Drugs and Drinking, an excerpt that says, uh, Explanatory Notes Upon the New Testament by John Wesley, on page 601. And he's talking about uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 12. And it says, All things are permissible for me, yet I will not be brought under the power of any, so as to be uneasy when I abstain from it. For if so, then I'm under the power of it. 
And that right there is talking about addiction. I'll read it one more time. Addiction. All things are permissible for me. All lawful things are permissible for me. Yet I will not be brought under the power of them. For if so, if you're brought under the power of it, you'll know it when you're uneasy, it becomes uneasy to abstain from it. For if so, then I'm under the power of it. Okay? So, you know, the use of drugs for recreational purposes uh, brings about that addiction. And addiction is one of the traps of Satan. Once we get dependent on these drugs, we have, to, we, we completely, our bodies have to, we're going to be looking for that pleasure. And our bodies cannot function properly. Okay. One last uh, excerpt from the book. He says, of all the drugs and the compulsive behavior that I've seen in the past 25 years, be it cocaine, heroin, or even alcohol, all have one common thread. That is the covering up or the masking or the unwillingness on the part of the human being to confront and be with his or, his or her human feelings. So what are these human feelings that they're trying to mask with the drugs and trying to get away from? It's, it's because of the sins that they've committed and the pain that the sin is bringing. The bottom line is the drugs are used and abused by its users for them to escape the harsh reality of this sin-sick world. So as a saint of Yahweh, we should ask ourselves, what is Yahweh's stake on the question of uh, using recreational drugs or even alcohol to the point of intoxication? So this problem with drug abuse is not something new. Real quick from the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica Micropedia, volume, volume 4, page 233, it says, the oldest existing catalog of drugs called pharmacopoeia is a stone tablet from ancient Babylonia and dates back to 1700 AY. That's back in Genesis. And also, we can also find it in the book of, we can also find it in the book of Deuteronomy, if you read on. So back to the drugs. In the scriptures, you can look through the scriptures, and you will not find anywhere that you will mention things like cocaine, heroin, opium, morphine, marijuana, PCP, LSD, or any other drugs. We're not going to find that. But if you turn over to page 172, you turn over to page 172, you find Deuteronomy uh, chapter 29, and we're going to start from verse 16. So, oh, wait up, hold up. Before that, let's read Leviticus 18 real quick. Leviticus 18. Starting from verse 1, it's on page 97. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, I am Yahweh your father. After the doings of the land of Egypt, where you dwelt, you shall not do. And after the doings of the land of, of, uh, the land of Canaan, where I'm bringing you, you shall not do. Neither shall you walk in their ordinances. And that word ordinances is Hebrew word number 2708, and it means appointed customs or manners. So we're not supposed to walk in the appointed customs or manners of the where we came from or where we're going to. Verse 4, you shall observe, my, observe and do my judgments and keep my ordinances. Keep Yahweh's ordinances, not the worldly ordinances, and walk in them. I am Yahweh. You must therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, he will live through them. I am Yahweh. And I remember it was brought out that when it says, I am Yahweh, that's Yahweh's stamp of approval right there. So if you keep his laws, you can guarantee, you can bet your life on that, that you're going to live. Okay? So let's go over to Deuteronomy 29. And from verse 16, it's almost talking about the same thing here. You yourselves, verse 16, you yourselves know how we lived in the land of Egypt and how we passed through the countries on the way here. You saw the abomination of gods among them, gods of wood, stone, silver, and gold. Verse 18, I solemnly entreat you to enter into the covenant and oath, for fear that there may, they might be among you a man, a woman, clan, tribe, and this day whose heart will turn away from Yahweh, our Father, and go to worship the gods, Elohim, of those nations, for fear that this, for, the, for fear there should be among you a root of bitter, a root that brings forth gall and wormwood, poison and bitterness. So, uh, back to the book, 
um, the drugs and drinking, what does the scriptures really teach? Speaking of Deuteronomy 16, and it's from uh, Deuteronomy 29, verse 16 through 20, it says, the first thing I want you to notice on there is the phrase gall and wormwood. So most people in the world today read over this, and they don't realize the meaning that those words possess. So the word gall is translated from the Hebrew word raush, raush, uh, I think that's how you pronounce it. And it's Hebrew word number 7219. And it means a uh, poisonous plant, a poppy, poisonous. In other words, it can be like gall, hemlock, poison, venom. And also from the analytical Hebrew and Childly lexicon by Benjamin Davidson on page 671, gives us this following information about the word rouch. It says, a poisonous plant, the poppy, opium. So that's sounding more familiar. The word wormwood is also uh, number 3939 and also possesses the same meanings as the word gall. Uh, wormwood, a poisonous, a poisonous plant, and it's going back to opium and from the popping plant. So what few people in the world never realize, what many people don't realize, is that the Hebrew words translated gall and wormwood describe the plant which, which the plant sources of chemicals which causes the users to lose control of their mental faculties. And that is Satan's goal right there. If, if we are under the influence of these drugs and we lost our mental faculty, we cannot make right choices. Most of the known substances that are abused as recreational drugs have their etymology in the, word, in the words gall and wormwood. Okay? So not, it's not something new. Okay, so this... The word opium from the Webster's Dictionary is uh, a narcotic drug prepared from the juice of, uh, of their unripe seed capsules of the opium poppy. It, contain, it contains alkaloids and is used as an intoxicant and med medicinally to relieve pain and produce sleep. A full dose is intoxicating and exhilarating, but its effects are dangerous and fatal if taken in large quantities. It's heavy and dense texture and a brownish yellow color, has a faint smell, and its taste is bitter or acrid. So uh, that right there is talking about the word, the word uh, gall and wormwood. We have, we have uh, the, gall wormwood, the word gall and wormwood, which all go to the word opium. And that's where most of the drugs uh, are produced from, from that plant. So, um, you know, we, right now in the world, we have doctors who prescribe these things. They're over-prescribing them, and they want you to get, to get uh, hooked on these drugs because they want to make a benefit from selling these drugs. You know, those people are referred to as sorcerers by the uh, Apostle Yakanan, and he says that they will have their part in the lake that burns with fire in Brimstone, Revelation 21.8, for your notes. Okay, and lastly, I'd like to talk about uh, Yeshua's example. On page 757, look at Yahweh. Page 757, it's Matthew 27, verse 34. Matthew 27, verse 34. And right before that, we see that, uh, and they, and Verse 33, and when they come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of skull. And right here, what we're seeing is that Yeshua Messiah was suffering terribly and was, was going through a lot of pain at this time. Verse 34, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, an opiate. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And in Yachanan, Mark, chapter 15, and verse 23, it says... They gave him wine mingled with mar to drink, but he would not accept it. The word mar in this verse is listed, is listed as word number 4669 in the Strong's Greek Dictionary, and it means a narcotic. So although it would, it would have not been a sin, this is passive writing right here, although it would have not been a sin, if Yeshua, it would, although it would not have been a sin for Yeshua to take the drug, 
Yeshua refused to take the narcotic drug for the intense pain he was suffering. Yeshua knew that his suffering and death were in fulfillment of the prophecies concerning himself. The scriptures plainly show that in order for Yeshua to be that perfect sacrifice, it was necessary for him to bear all the pain in his body that sin brings. In order for Yeshua to pay the death penalty that our sins had earned, he had to endure a great deal of pain that was inflicted upon him. And my last scripture is Isaiah 53, verse 4 through 5. It says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by our, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. So if Yeshua had taken the narcotic drug that was offered to him and allowed the pain to be numbed, he would have not suffered as the prophecy said he must. He would not then have borne our sins in his body and would have not qualified to be our Messiah. No, it is not a sin to use certain drugs or chemicals if it's done for a genuine medical condition. Genuine medical condition and in the amount prescribed by a legitimate physician. But we still have to keep in touch with the, our counselors and, our, and the priests in the house to know what is right and what is wrong. The scriptures do not condemn all drug use. We need to be very careful if we do take any medication that we do not deceive ourselves into allowing our minds to become clouded by taking drugs for pleasure's sake. Recreational drugs, which include the sin of drunkenness, is one of Satan's greatest tools in deceiving the whole world. There's simply no way a person, uh, uh, there's simply no way a person whose mind is clouded with, clouded with recreational drugs can discern righteousness from evil. So, as you can see there, we need to be great examples. We need to be very careful of what we're doing. As right now, it's going to be brought mostly like how it was brought out that we need that we're being watched and we're being judged right now. So we have to be great example and we have to be very careful of our very of, of our very actions. So, and with that, we can all please stand. I turn it over. Son of Israel, DK Nadabi. Some great saints, you may be seated. Mm. We turn it over to page 981 in your books of Yahweh. The title of my speech is called The Pandemic of 1918. In the winter of 1918, the coldest the American Midwest had ever endured, history's most lethal influenza virus was born. Over the next year, it flourished, killing as many as 100 million people. It killed more people in 24 weeks than AIDS killed in 24 years. More people in a year than the Black Death of the Middle Ages killed in a century. There were many echoes of the Middle Ages in 1918. Victims turned blue-black and priests in some of the world's most modern cities drove horse-drawn carts down the streets calling upon people to bring out their dead. Um, it's taken from The Great Influenza, a book by John M. Barry. Uh, on 6-12, I'd put the pandemic of 1918 into Gematria. It was in one of Pastor's writings. Um, and it came out English number 1668. Global health experts have been saying for years that another pandemic whose speed and severity rivaled those of the 1918 influenza epidemic was, not, was a matter not of if, but of when. That's taken from responding to COVID-19, a once in a century pandemic which cites Bill Gates paper on the Ebola. On Revelation 16, 2, the first plague. And the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and there came a noisome and grievous sore upon the men who had the mark of the beast and upon those who worshipped his likeness. That word sore is, this, is the only, the one of three times that that word is in the second book of Yahweh right there. It's number 1668. The pandemic of 19 ties directly to the first plague. That's amazing. Um, Sorry. Uh, be turning over to page 412 in your books, Yahweh, Job chapter 2. <clears throat> 2 verse 1, again there was a day when the sons of Yahweh came to present themselves before Yahweh and Satan the adversary and accuser 
also came among them to present herself before Yahweh. That's where we heard of that. Yahweh said to Satan, where did you come from? Satan answered Yahweh and said, from going back and forth in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Then Yahweh said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, a perfect, blameless, and upright man, one who reverences Yahweh and shuns evil, and still holds fast to his integrity, even though you incited me against him to destroy him without a cause. So Satan answered Yahweh and said, Skin for skin, a man will give all he has for his own life. But reach out with your own hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will curse you to your face. Then Yahweh replied to Satan and said, Behold, he is in your power, but you must spare his life. Let me repeat that. You must spare his life. Um, this next article, it's a pain I can't even describe. Milwaukee woman shares her experience with COVID-19. When Adrian Lathan felt like she was coming down with a cold in mid-March, she had no idea what the next month had in store for her. Lathan's doctor called the following morning to tell her the flu test came back negative. Her coronavirus results were pending, but by that evening, the pain became so unbearable, Lathan said. My entire body was hurting, my eyes were hurting from the headache, and I just couldn't take it anymore, she said. It was just too much to deal with. I was in so much pain, she said. It's a pain I can't even describe. At times, her headache was so bad she needed the lights off. It was like a migraine times five, she said. This next article, Doctor with COVID, it was actually a video. Doctor with COVID-19 describes symptoms as pain everywhere. NBC News Now. Look to uh, Eob 2, verse 7. Then Satan left Yahweh's presence and afflicted Eob with a severe skin inflammation with painful sores from the bottom of his foot to the top of his head. This next article, are COVID toes and rashes common symptoms of the coronavirus? Dr. Choi says, like rashes, COVID toes are just another way that the body can respond to a viral infection. It's a different form or manifestation, and it is still not very clear what causes it. One pattern of COVID toes that people are reporting is red lesions typically on the soles. It is possible that this is a skin reaction or caused by a small clog or microclots in the blood vessels found in the toes, Dr. Joyce Choi says. Now let's look to Job 2.7 in the King James Version. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot. Does anybody know what that next word is? Unto his, anybody guess? Crown. Crown. Praise Yahweh. You starting to catch on? There's a pattern. So Eob 2, 7 in the book of Yahweh, the word afflicted is word number 52, 21, comes from word number 43, 47, and it means plague. Painful is word number 74, 51, and it means noisome and grievous. From the bottom is word number 37, 09, and it means from the hollow hand or the palm of the soul and even of the bowl of a dish. Of his foot is word number 72, 72, and it means times. The top of his head is word number 69, 36. And it means crown. The top of the head, so-called from the hair, being divided and separated. Divided and separated. So, EO 2.7, simply putting these words into that scripture in the places where they came from. EO 2.7 reads, Then Satan left Yahweh's presence and afflicted Job with the plague of noisome and grievous sores from the bowl of the divided times, Corona crown. Is that not amazing? I've been having a, a nuclear meltdown in my past head, my head for the past months, just like, man, praise Yahweh. Um, 61820, Pastor wrote a newsletter 
Um, you always branch. It, I, I advise you to get on there every prep day night or on uh, the night before prep day and prep day morning and read it, man. Uh, coronavirus does not kill, say, prophecy, science, and doctors proving Yahweh true. Pastor wrote in there, the evil ways of the gods will bring six more plagues that prophecy shows will be killers. The coronavirus is not what kills. Yahweh shows us that in prophecy. Look back up to verse 6. And then Yahweh replied to Satan and said, Behold, he is in your power, but you must spare his life. You can't kill him. That's prophecy right there, man. That's beautiful. Proven pastor words true. The coronavirus is not what kills. Yahweh shows us that in prophecy. Turn over to page 414. Um, Job 5, verse 17. Behold. Behold. That word, behold, man. That word, behold. Behold. Please, Lord, behold. Blessed is the man whom Yahweh creates corrects, so do not reject the discipline of the Almighty. Look to verse 19. He, will, he shall save you from six troubles. Yes, in seven no harm shall touch you. That's, I don't know about you, but the word of Yahweh is... Uh, Truly amazing. Um, let me go back for a moment. The pandemic of 1918 was the title of this speech. That's the name of um, that I put. That's what I put in Gematria. Um, I put that phrase in numerous different times over the past months when this stuff started taking place. And I never got what I put in there. And it wasn't until one day I was reading pastor's teachings, and then the pandemic of 1918 was in there. And I put it in Gematria. And sure enough, it led straight to the first plague. Um, the pandemic of 1918 was also Jewish number 744. The book that I first, uh, it's literally right on the inside of the cover that I took the first quote from, from the pandemic of 1918. The Great Influenza. The guy that wrote that, John M. Berry, you put that in Gematria, 744. Um, but in closing, I would like to say, blessed is the man whom Yahweh corrects. Corrects. Please do not dismiss correction. Be from the smallest babe to uh, your supervisor, the priest over you, the south office, ruler himself, overseer Israel, Abel Hawkins. And especially that little small voice that fleets, it's gone so fast you don't even hardly notice it. If you pray about it, it'll start staying a little bit longer and a little bit longer. That's, that's correction from Yahweh. That's spirit holy. We need to hold on to it. Um, and, and if we can overcome the stupidity, speaking mainly to myself here, uh, Yahweh will save us through these next six times of trouble, and we'll make it through all seven untouched. That I'd like to turn over to the uh, next speaker, the great. If you would all please stand. I'd like to turn over to the next speaker, great Deacon David DePass. Shabbat shalom. Please be seated. Yahweh's peace be with you and every one of you. Yahweh bless you understand today. So when you think about it, there's only two types of people that exist. You have those who make decisions based on the facts and those who make decisions based on their feelings. I would dare say that all the problems that exist in the world are caused by those who make decisions by their feelings. And you see on the news, fights, riots, people fighting over toilet papers, people fighting over all crazy things, going to the store, throwing stuff, or even at the school, school shootings, um, even the families, domestic violence. Uh, all these problems are caused by those who make decisions by their feelings, right? 
So I just want to talk on two subjects or two different um, um, elements, health and finances. Let's start with finances. The reason why, why mo most people are broke today or poor, well, it's because they make decisions based on their feelings, not the facts. They focus on their wants rather than their, what they need to buy, right? Or they, they get the check first at the end of the week, they blow it out on all this unnecessary stuff, spend thousands and thousands of dollars on all this junk that they don't need, and they forget their obligations. They're supposed to provide for the family, right? Put food on the table, clothes, and provide for them. They forget all the things that they need to get, but focus on their wants, right? And what occurs to these people? They have outstanding balances, low credit scores. They're always in the hole. They're always enslaved to the system. They're always in debt. They're always stuck. And you see this taking place on the holiday season, right? They buy all this unnecessary junk, toys, gifts, and end of the month, they're broke. How do you spell trouble? That's what they're in, right? Then let's go with health. Do you know one of the main causes of diseases is depression? So why people get depressed? Well, somebody that they close to them dies, passes away, and they no longer can function, right? So what occurs to these people? They occur in depressed mode. They get depressed. They start leaving out the Dunkin' Donuts and Krispy Kremes and Sonic and Wendy's, all these fast food restaurants. They live off of junk food, right? They smoke 10 packs of cigarettes a day. They do illegal drugs. They, we wrote to... Um, uh, um, smoke illegal drugs, they, 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 they live unhealthy lives, they become overweight and fluffy, right? Like the little Pillsbury guy, right? And they, uh, they can, all, can never get out of the situation, they're stuck. So then what occurs to these people? Then they start developing heart attacks, heart diseases, stroke, cancer, diabetes, uh, lung cancer, all these diseases. Why? Because they were feeding their emotions the whole time. They never learn to move forward. It crushes them. It destroys them. And they die at a young age because they were fixated on their feelings. You know, what's here? They were stuck. They never learn to move forward. You see, the facts is always there to remind you that you live in the real world, regardless of how you feel. So that's why it's so important, brothers and sisters, don't make decisions based on your feelings. Make decisions based on the facts. If you want, that's the title of my sermon. Don't make decisions based on your feelings. Make decisions based on the facts. The Peace of Solution teaches that we must control our thoughts, control our feelings. You know how this works. Thoughts lead to feelings, feelings lead to actions, and actions lead to rewards and consequences. And Yahweh works the same way, too. And for us to remain in Yahweh's house and to make it to Yahweh's kingdom, Yahweh demands obedience, right? Yahweh demands obedience. And there's thousands and thousands of examples in the book of Yahweh where you have those who made decisions based on the facts and those who made decisions based on their feelings. Let's start in the beginning. Cain and Abel, right? Now... Abel was righteous, right? But Cain was the emotional one, right? He was one that was fixated on his emotions. And Yahweh accepted Abel's offering, but he didn't accept the Cain. He said, no, Cain, I'm not going to accept your offering. No, I'm not going to accept you, you. You know my requirements. You know my protocol. Go fix your problems, Cain, right? But what Cain was doing, Cain was so fixated on what he was feeling, what he was feeling, anger, Anger, emotion that's not controlled, leads into serious problems. Cain was angry. He was fixated on this anger. And Yahweh told him to repent, right? But Cain was so fixated on what he was feeling. But what occurred to, what, what, what occurred to Cain? He committed a murder. Killed his own brother, Abel, first righteous priest, right? When Yahweh instructed the children of Israel. Don't go marry these heathen women. 
Don't go marry these God worshipers. Don't, don't stand your sons for your daughters or your daughters for your sons. Why? Because you're going to bring this negative influence to your family. You're going to bring this God worship to your family and have no part with unbelievers, right? But if we would occur to King Solomon, King Solomon had an all-star team of heathen women that he married, right? Because they were almost attractive were beautiful, whatever, but it was lust, lust, another emotion, not control, leads to serious problems. King Solomon was so fixated on what he was feeling, right? His feelings. He's fixated on them, his feelings, that he married these unbelievers, and what occurred? He fell into God worship. His heathen wives told him to build pagan images that had nothing to do with the worship of Yahweh. And the whole house of Israel fell into God worship because of King Solomon, who was fixated on his feelings. And all this occurred under King Solomon's rule. And, and, and the whole house of Israel fell into God worship because someone made decisions based on what they were feeling, right? And now you have those who made decisions based on the facts. So when Yahweh told Abraham to take your son, have him slaughtered at the altar, have him sacrificed there, your only son that was born from Sarah, was Abraham emotional? Was Abraham heartbroken? You bet. He was hurt. He was destroyed. Everything was coming against Abraham. He was like, Yahweh, Yahweh, what? Why, Yahweh? It's my son, Yahweh. Why? Right? All these things were going through Abraham's mind. But did Abraham make decisions based on his feelings? No. Abraham made decisions based on the facts. And the fact is, Yahweh demands obedience. Yahweh demands obedience. Abraham made decisions based on the facts, and he was blessed by Yahweh. Yahweh came through for Abraham. Yahweh came through for Abraham. Here's another one. Eo, right? Beautiful family, wife, kids, children, all these great things, right? He had ox, sheep, donkeys, all these possessions. It was all in Eob's. He had it, right? In heartbeat, he lost everything he had. Like that. Again. Was Eob emotional? You bet. His heart was broken. He's like, what was it me? Why am I deserving this shabby treatment? What did I do? What did I, why, why is this? And his wife, who was very emotional, was encouraging him to make decisions based on his emotions. Just, hey, yo, what are you doing? Do you see the injustice that Yahweh has done to you? Curse Yahweh and die. Right? Once again, Dio made decisions based on his feelings? No, Eo made decisions based on the facts. And the fact is that Yahweh is righteous, so there's something that I need to look into myself. There's some self, soul, soul searching, as they call it. Some self-reflection that I have to do on my part. Eo, not once, did Eo curse Yahweh with his mouth, right? Eob made decisions based on the facts. And once again, he was blessed by Yahweh. Yahweh came through for Eob. Yahweh came through for Eob. Right? And the same thing occurs in many, many thousands and thousands of examples in the scriptures. We have those who made decisions based on the facts and those who made decisions based on their feelings. As examples, testimonials, and lessons to learn not to make decisions based on your feelings, but make decisions based on the facts. It's very important, brothers and sisters, to focus on the facts, what's around you, okay? And it's the same thing we have in Yahweh's house today. The same thing we have in Yahweh's house, believe it or not. Why we have followers, right? Think about it. Why we have those who leave Yahweh's house? Could be many reasons, but the, I bet you the common denominator is this, brothers and sisters, they make decisions based on their feelings 
and Satan takes them out, right? Everything becomes a problem for these people. I, I can't take this brother. I can't take this sister. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. They stockpile all their feelings, right? And so they make decisions based on their feelings. They, they forget the facts. What are the facts? The law says, yeah, what, what called you to Yahweh's house? What brought you here? The law says, Yahweh is the truth. That's a fact. The laws of Yahweh is the truth. That's a fact. The house of Yahweh is protected in the prophesied place. That's a fact. Yisrael Hawkins is Yahweh's last day's witness. That's a fact. These are all facts. You can't deny the facts, right? These are all facts. But when people leave the house of Yahweh, they forget the facts. They focus on their feelings. They focus on themselves. Me, 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 right? They develop this selfish and self-centered attitude, and they run outside the gates, and it occurs all the time, all the time. So the bottom line is this, brothers. I hope this registers. I hope this sinks in. I hope the lesson here today is this. Don't make decisions based on your feelings. Make decisions based on the facts. It's very important, brothers and sisters. Don't make decisions based on your feelings. And I know it's hard. It takes work. It takes discipline. It takes setting your mind in advance as the piece of solution teaches. Control your thoughts. Control your feelings. Make decisions based on the facts. And you'll be blessed by Yahweh. It's a promise. You'll be blessed by Yahweh. And I just want to read a couple of scriptures as encouragement. Um, you turn over to Uremia chapter, Uremia chapter 17. Let's look at verse 7. And it says here, Blessed is the man who trusts in Yahweh, and whose hope is in Yahweh. For he will be like a tree planted by the, the, the waters, which spreads out his roots by the river. And he will not fear when he comes. His leaves are always green. He will not be worried in the year of drought and never cease to yield his fruit. But pay attention to verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, Yahweh, search the heart. I test the mind of men. I give every man according to his ways and according to the fruits of his doings. And um, we turn over to um, Proverbs chapter 28. And let's look at verse 26. It says, he who trusts in his own heart is a fool. But whoever walks wisely will be delivered. They will be delivered by Yahweh, right? So the bottom line is this, brothers and sisters, don't focus on your feelings. A lot of things take back, uh, um, a lot of negative outcomes when you focus on your feelings. You can get hurt. You can be broke. You can kill somebody. You can get killed yourself. Make decisions based on the facts, what's presented to you, your surroundings, and you'll be blessed by Yahweh. And with that, we call peace out. I the pleasure to turn this service over by Deacon Samuel Askins Hawkins. Shabbat shalom, brethren. Please be seated. And let the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. When you give a speech, normally you want to focus on one or two main points. And I'd like to bring out three points today, and then we'll wind them all together to form one main idea. And this is called a chord of three strands. It starts with the story of the 912 prophecy given to pastor by Yahshua, and Pastor brought out about the start of nuclear war, 9-12-2006. And at that time, I was not a baptized member of the House of Yahweh. But when I heard the prophecy, I made my decision to get here. I had been watching and listening to sermons, and I had a book of Yahweh, and I could see that Pastor was telling the truth. I just hadn't taken action on what I knew to be true. So at Passover 2006, I traveled here and I got baptized and I was blessed with tests almost immediately. And that was okay. 
Yahweh was proving me and building my endurance. Yahweh's warned us through pastor to do the best, to do our best to get here if we can. Did you ever think that that date might come up, come up again, the 9-12, would be significant and come up again later in prophecy? The time is short, so get here if you can. Call the office and ask for their advice. Ask at Abel. So picture this with me. This is point number one. The date is 9-12-2006, and there I was in my big, comfortable blue recliner. And I think we have a, a shot of that. That's the actual chair I was sitting in. I had spent a hot summer passing out flyers to anyone who would listen about the soon-coming nuclear war. Of course, whenever I was off from my regular job or if it was on the Sabbath day, there's a, a shot of that flyer. I think, that's, I think that's the one that we used. So I was sitting in my chair that evening, and I have my remote control in my hand and some snacks, I'm sure, and my feet up, and I'm scanning the news channels. ABC, click. CBS, click. NBC, click. Even CNN. The whole alphabet soup of media outlets I used to be a news junkie, and I would constantly check to see if they would mess up and accidentally let out some of the truth. But I was finding nothing about nuclear war at the time. What I was seeing were constant replays of President George Bush Jr., who had given a speech the night before, and it was still being repeated over and over. And I think we have a, a shot of the beginning of that speech It was a we're going to get you terrorist type of speech. And it was still being replayed over and over. Do we have that slide? It was the fifth anniversary of 9-11. And I was watching for nuclear weapons exploding. And what I found was the leader of the world's strongest military threatening more retaliation. And you can see the date there and the time he started. Interesting fact, that speech was actually given on 9-12. It was the evening before, but it was after sunset. And if you could go to the next slide. It was after sunset when they aired the live broadcast, which made it 9-12 according to how Yahweh counts the days. And that's shown in the first chapter of Genesis. And I didn't know that at the time, but after a couple of hours of scanning the news, I found myself saying, I wonder if it's something symbolic in the president's speech, right? Here's another thing that I didn't know at the time. Pope Benedict in Germany on that exact same day gave what has since come to be known as the Riesenberg Address. And it went throughout the world and it sparked and provoked anger and protests in Islamic countries around the world. And in the speech, the Pope, he quotes an ancient Byzantine emperor's critical view of, in, of Islam. And you can see that that was on September 12th. And both speeches made on 9-12 went throughout the whole world. So basically the Pope was sparking anger and hatred around the Muslim world, and President Bush was inspiring fear and dread throughout the whole Muslim world. And isn't that exactly what the Nimrod system has always done? It provokes fear, anger, hatred, fighting and war, disease and destruction, evil like the gods. So let's fast forward for a minute to story number two. But keep in mind what we just found. I was watching for the start of nuclear war but what I found was fear and hatred being pushed by the Pope and the President. And a couple of years later, in 2008, pastors started a series of sermons that explained the essence of the House of Yahweh compared to the essence of the Catholic Church. And he called it the characteristic feature of each system. Over several sermons, he went into detail, highlighting the differences between the God system and Yahweh's system. Look up those sermons if you can. 
But here's what it boils down to. The characteristic feature of the house of Yahweh is true, perfect peace. It is Yahweh making us into his image and likeness by teaching us to keep his laws. And the characteristic feature of the Catholic Church is doing away with the laws of Yahweh and encouraging people to break them. They tell you, just do whatever is in your heart. And this is what leads to all the fear and the hatred that prevails in this world today. So that's part two. Now for part three, and then we'll wind these stories together. Remember, this is about the 9 12, 2006 prophecy about the start of nuclear war. And that word nuclear comes from the word nucleus, of course, which means a central or essential part around which other parts are grouped or collected. Saying it another way, the nucleus is something regarded as the basis for future development and growth, a kernel, as in a seed kernel. Do you know what a simple and perfect two-word definition of a nucleus is? Characteristic feature. Pastor could have just as easily said the nucleus of the house of Yahweh instead of characteristic feature with no loss in meaning. The definition that we get from Webster's second collegiate, uh, new collegiate edition is the inner part of a seed which has life in it and from which the tree grows. The point is this. Two characteristic features, or two nuclei, went to war on that day, 9-12-2006. Nuclear war started on that day. Wickedness came out openly at war against any who would practice any form of holiness or righteousness. If you were here at that time and you stayed, it was because you believed without seeing. You didn't need a nuclear bomb to explode to prove it. In your belief, you obeyed without seeing. And about you, Yahshua Messiah says, Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. And that's Yachin on 20, verse 29 for your notes. Also, Ephesians 6.12, We wrestle not only with flesh and blood, but also against principalities, against powers, and against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual forces of the evil one in the heavens. We have been engaged in spiritual warfare since that time. A war on our way of thinking, our characteristic feature, our nucleus, is still war. When the Pope issued on 628, uh, 629, 2008, his decree to remove the name Yahweh and speak it not, wasn't he striking at the nucleus of our beliefs? When pastor openly refutes the Pope's foolishness, he strikes the foundation of their belief system. When pastor was falsely arrested in 2008, it was a continuation of the war of the characteristic features that started on 9-12-2006. And on and on it's gone since that time. The nucleus of truth struggling and wrestling to get this message out against the nucleus of lies that covers the whole world. An interesting detail related to the word nucleus before we wrap up. An anthropologist named George P. Murdoch in 1947 coined the term nuclear family. It is used to describe the basic family unit. The father, the mother, and the children all in one household. The father, that's Yahweh. The mother, that's the house of Yahweh. And the children all in one household. That's us. It's a pretty great description. And so, as we wrap up, turn to Revelation 9-12, since we're talking about the 9-12 prophecy. And this is why Pastor is the man. He's the son of man. He showed us the coronavirus prophecy as it was just getting started. He showed us that corona means crown. 
referenced in verse 7. Locusts on the earth in verse 3. That's in Africa at this time. And it will last five moons in verse 5. And also, they had hair as a woman. Verse 8. Possibly because nobody could get a haircut during the lockdown. And in verse 12, Revelation 9, 12, one woe is past. Behold, there come two more woes after this. If you can hear the voice of Yisrael, Yahweh's last day's witness, strive to get here soon. And if you can't get here soon, get here even sooner. Let this be your time to believe without seeing. Because if you wait to see it, it will be too late. Study Revelation eleven fourteen, 14, which shows that you do not have time to wait for the second woe because the third woe comes quickly after it. Whatever you do, focus on righteousness and study. Keep going forward. Let your characteristic feature be the house of Yahweh, true, perfect peace. Yahweh will make a way for those who are His, even in the farthest reaches of the earth. And with that, I appreciate your time and attention. Please stand, and I'll turn it over to the great deacon, Aaron DeFrades Hawkins. Praise Yahweh. Uh, please be seated. <sighs> The peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. Uh, it's always a privilege and an honor to come before the called out ones. Uh, the family of Yahweh, the most aha uh, people on the face of the earth. A lot of times we don't know how important we are, but here in a little bit we'll realize who we are eventually. Uh, my title today, Believe What Yahweh Says. Uh, if we recall, that's our law. You know, that's the law, positive law number one. Believe in Yahweh as the only source of power in the universe. That's found on page 61 of your book of Yahweh. Yeah, Exodus 20 and verse 2, it says, I am Yahweh, your heavenly father, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And we know Egypt means sin, out of the house of bondage. You know, the bondage that uh, a lot of the speakers before me were speaking about. You know, the financial bondage, because you wasn't taught how to... Use wisdom to use the things you, you own. Um, okay, believe it or not, Yahweh brought us here. If wherever we are, wherever we are, once you could hear this broadcast, Yahweh led you to this, to this house of Yahweh. It says the word believe in Strong's uh, Hebrew lexicon is word number 539, Amon. It means to be upright, to build up, to support, to foster. The nurse, you know, we've been talking about those who nurse, nurse the house of Yahweh. Uh, figuratively, to render, to be firm, to be faithful, to trust, and to believe. It also says to be permanent, because you can't believe today, say, I believe, and then next week is like, yeah, I didn't believe. Then you didn't believe in the first place. And then it says to be quiet. The word also means to be quiet. And we know that in our... Ecclesiastes 5 and 1, it says, you know, watch your foot and be more ready to listen than, you know, read it for yourself. <laughs> um, it means to be morally true and certain. Uh, how many people know that, you know, I'm not really the best at grammar and all of that? Well, the word believe, it's a verb. You know, it means it's a doing or an action word. You know, it's a word that you have to do something in order to believe. You have to be doing something. And if we say we believe, then we have to be doing something. And what we should be doing, it says here, and that is what Yahweh says in Deuteronomy uh, 28 and verse 1. It says, and if you will, if you will listen diligently to the voice of your father, Yahweh, by observing and doing all his laws, and, and that's found on page 169, by the way, if you want to look it up. Um, uh, that Yahweh your Father has, has commanded you, it says that Yahweh your Father will set you high above all nations on earth as kings and priests. As kings and priests and queens and, and high queens. And, and it says in this, this work, Amosia 3 and verse 7 is found on page uh, 6. 
96 of the book of Yahweh, it says, Most assuredly, Father Yahweh will have no work other than the work he has prophesied in advance by his servants, the prophets. His servants, the prophets. You know, most people, I know we all came from Egypt. And when you hear somebody speak about, you know, they felt this feeling to... It's always from the heart they felt it. It's never from prophesied. You know, it has to be prophesied in advance. His servants, the, the prophet, it has to be prophesied from adva in advance. Uh, Zechariah 6 and verse 12, it says, Speak to him. This is what Yahweh the says. Behold, and that word behold means is to pay attention to. You know, pay attention to, to listen the man whose name is the branch. For he will branch out and build the house of Yahweh. He will branch out and build the house of Yahweh. So who built the house of Yahweh? Let me hear you. Who built the house of Yahweh? We're standing here right now. No, we're sitting. Who built the house of Yahweh? He built it and we follow along. We learn from him and we follow along. So we're in a really, really great position already. Since we start following him. Uh, and this, this is all facts. You know, in, uh, you can check it out in the, in the um, Yahweh's House Established booklet. I found it in the, in the um, study guide. Because I got one of those. In the, you know, those, if you don't have one, you need one. It's got a lot of stuff in there that will help you to understand the way of Yahweh. It says that the House of Yahweh was chartered. Charter was granted to the House of Yahweh by the state of Texas in the 21st day of the 7th Roman month, 1981. Uh, well, first it was established in the mobile home. Everybody remember about the little chicken pen, mobile home chicken pen. And then it was uh, the Internal Revenue Service of the United States of Amer America officially recognized an est the establishment of the House of Yahweh, the establishment of the House of Yahweh, in the fourth day of the second Roman month, 1983. So it's registered. And nobody else could be House of Yahweh. Nobody else in the state of Texas and even in the world. And, and that's a blessing for us. Uh, Micaiah, spoken of in advance. Micaiah 4.1, it says, yeah, 4.1 to 3, it says, but in the last days... And we could clearly see we're in the last days. If anybody have a problem with that, just pay attention to what's going on. It's not just us, no, it's the last days. It says, in the last days, it will come to pass that the mountain promotion of the house of Yahweh will be established in the chief of the nation. And which nation is the chief of the nation? Say it loud, man. USA, the United States of America. It is the chief of the nation. It will be raised above all congregation and all people will eventually flow to it. And it's established. And we're waiting for it to be raved above all congregation. And the people is flowing to it. It's almost four point something million people viewing us every week. You know? So don't believe. Eventually, when they flow to it, what are we going to teach them? It says here, and many people... And many nations will come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain, to the house of Yahweh, to the uplifted of Yahweh, to the house of Yahweh of, of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways. Who will teach us? Who will teach them? Us! Through Israel. What Israel teach us, we will teach them. And that's why we got to learn. That's why we got to keep believing what the one cent says. It's not he. When he says he, pastor's talking about us. Us. We is Yahweh to the people. If we start realizing how important we are, that's what keeps me up at night. You know, that's what keeps me up going, am I, am I, am I really believing what Yahweh says? He says, yeah, and many, uh, and he will teach us of his ways, and we'll walk in his path, because the laws will depart from Zion, and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem, and he will judge many nations, and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they'll beat their swords into plowshares with the peaceful solution that we're learning right now. We don't learn violence in there. We don't force each other. We're learning those lessons now. And we're really learning those lessons now. 
um, and their spears into pruning hooks, and nations will not lift up swords against nations, nor they learn war anymore. Okay. Well, it says the same thing in Isaiah 2 and verse 2 to 4. You know, that after Israel teach us, he'll send us to teach the nations. It's the same thing it says, and that's found on page 531 of the book of Yahweh. In the fourth book of Israel, it's the reverence of Yahweh, uh, number 17, uh, verse uh, 84. Print's real small. It says here, yeah, uh, the preachers stand up and say, they say, God is all over the world. He fools the earth. You just worship him anywhere you want. They don't like the part when you tell them that you need to go where he chooses to place his name. They don't like that at all. But in fact, he tells you, you must seek the place he choose, and there you must go. Yahshua says, if you don't do this, you ain't going to be in the kingdom. This is the will of the Father. You're not going to be one that is chosen to teach peace so that the nations will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Uh, Deuteronomy 5, 12 and verse 5, it says, but you, must seek the, but you are to seek the habitation of your father, the house of Yahweh, the place where Yahweh chooses to place his name. Choose out of your tribes to place his name. There you must go. Not there you go if you feel like going. It says there you must go. But in the last days, you know, Yahweh did this for us. Yahweh did this for us in these last days. A place where we come and learn. Some of us been here 40 years. Some been 20, 30, 10, 5. Yahweh knows what time to call you in. And that's the beauty of it. When Yahshua say, they all get, all get the same reward if they do the same work. If they fully believe and, and push forward the same work. It says here, believe in Yahweh. Well, my notes. And the word believe is uh, 5... 39 in Strong's Hebrew, it means to build up, to support this work, to support the work of Yahweh, and to be firm, to be firm in our actions, not, I do this on Sabbath, and then during the week, I, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, Metitia, uh, Metitia 6 and verse 33, found on page 733 of the book of Yahweh, it says, seek first, but you must, but you seek it says, but seek you first the kingdom of Yahweh and his righteousness, and all things will be added unto you. Now, the speakers spoke before me, and they kind of laid it out there. They know the suffering, the suffering that this world is going through right now, the bondage that Yahweh has been warning us of, that we've been coming out of. You know, and I know a lot of us, when stuff wasn't in the store, we was like... <laughs> We got storage. You know, when it wasn't in the store, you didn't really freak out and run. You know, oh, I need to buy. Because we've been doing these things for years. Social distancing, mask, not touching everything you see, not touching everybody you see. You know, these things, I mean, oh, I need, I, I'm bored home. I need to go to the mall. I need to go get myself in, with some de defilement. It says here, um, Oh, it's my notes again. <laughs> um, Isaiah 24 and verse 6. I think it's verse 5. Verse 5. It says, these things come upon them because they transgress the law. And at this time, I want to speak to my young brothers, you know, my young sisters, young people in the house of Yahweh. And some of my younger, I know y'all don't want to feel left out, my older young brethren and Sisters, you know, the older ones, people I talk to. Uh, don't give your strength to greedy and lustful men. You know, men who use you and tell you silly little words and teach you a nursery rhyme from your day you was born. Nursery rhymes that lead you to sin. Everything you remember, I bet you I could say one thing right now and it'll bring up some goofy little nursery rhyme. It, but the things that pastor have been teaching us, it brings forth life. Two wrongs don't make a right. Tell me how you could get some sin out of that that brings forth death. You don't get no sin out of that. You know? Do not steal. Do not covet. How do you get sin out of do not covet? If that's the first thing on your mind, you can't get sin out of that. 
It says here, um, my notes, uh, you know, Yahweh established his house as an inheritance for us. This is, this is our house. This is what Yahweh gave us. This is, this is our inheritance. And we need to seek wisdom here at Yahweh's house and seek the blessings. Pastor never said, oh, believe me, just believe me. Don't, just be-. He always say, study it for yourself. Study it. Don't, take my, don't just take my word. Study these things. And then hold fast. As the deacon say, hold fast to the facts. Not the emotions. You know, don't be influenced by the things we see online. You know, it just makes me feel great. So I watch it. These things cloud our mind. And it, it, it really destroys our ability to make sound, you know, sound decisions. Uh, let me go down here. It says the word listen in... Webster's, it says, to pay attention to a sound, it means diligently, with care and conscientiousness, which is the desire to do a task well, to take obligations to others seriously. But this is what I understand. You know, this is what helps me to believe what Yahweh says, so that I could escape these things that is in the world right now. And this is what we all should, you know, pay attention to. Take the facts. And get away from the sicknesses and diseases of this world. And with that, I would like to turn it over. If you'll all please stand. It's a privilege to turn it over to the great Kahan. Kahan Matitya Asma Hawkins. Shabbat shalom, great saints of Yahweh. You could be seated. privilege and honor to come before the great saints of Yahweh. If you will be turning in your scriptures to Psalms chapter 65 and verse 4. Psalms chapter 65 and verse 4. We're truly blessed in these last days to have this authority from Yahweh to learn at the feet of the one sent. The one who's been sent to, to bring back the name of Yahweh, the book of Yahweh, and to establish Yahweh's house in these last days. Now the title of my sermonette today is, We're Almost One's Sent. We're Almost One's Sent. Remember, you know, pastors, his his job is to to teach and to bring forth the holiest of the holies. You know, and his desire is to teach us, you know, the things that we need to learn so that we would be able to learn those things to bring these to teach others. You know, starting with, you know, those who are left alive from the destruction of the earth after these plagues finish, and then spreading forth to the universe. In Psalms chapter 65 and verse 4, it says, Blessed is the man whom you chose, whom you caused to approach you to dwell in your courts. We will be satisfied with the pleasures of your house, of your holy sanctuary. Now, Yahweh chooses men and women to be teachers in his house. You know, those, those who teach in Yahweh's house have been ordained by Lot, taught and trained by the one Yahweh sent Israel Abel Hawkins to teach and to do their jobs. And, and we all here in Yahweh's house have been called to be teachers. You know, if you remember, Pastor gave a sermon many years ago where he said, we've got to have teachers. In fact, everyone in Yahweh's house has got to be teachers. In the fourth book of Israel, chapter 28, Fourth book of Israel, chapter 28. This is the sermon Pastor gave on 7 13, 1991. This is the Reverence of Yahweh series, number 21. Pastor shows here in verse 16, he says, Now, if we don't learn how to reverence Yahweh and don't set our minds to do so, we won't be in the house. Okay, remember having the reverence for Yahweh, you know, the, the deepest respect and, and the, the desire to keep all of those laws. Yahweh's promise is just that. You won't be in his house if you don't learn to reverence him. Only those who learn to reverence him will be there. And in verse 18, he says, This doesn't mean that others won't receive eternal life. But the family, okay, so Yahweh is building a family of sons and daughters, priests and priestesses, but the family who Yahweh is choosing will be the highest ranking. Their ranks will continue through all eternity. 
In fact, you will be governing the whole universe if you will learn to reverence Yahweh now. Okay, so our, our time for training. Remember, we've been given the authority to learn now. That's why Yahweh's called us here to his house in these last days, to be able to learn, to be able to learn what to teach so that when we're sent out, we'll be ready to teach those things. And also in the fourth book of Israel, chapter 11, and verse 34, fourth book of Israel, chapter 11, verse 34, pastor says, you're going to be sent out by Yahweh to teach these laws. Yahweh says, because you have done my will, I am going to protect you. I am going to set you before nations. You know, what do we see today among the nations? You know, as, as prophecy showed, we see the nations are angry. You know, we see the, the turmoil and the uh, disunity and the, the oppression and the war and the fighting continually, you know, which was, which was prophesied because Cain, you know, chose to go the way of the gods, chose to follow this deception, and, and all the world has followed Cain in this deception, as Yada 1.11 says. But Yahweh promises, because we have done His will, He's going to protect us. He's going to set us before nations. Why does he set us before nations? To teach them rebellion or to teach them to live by his word? Yes, it's to teach them to live by the, every word of Yahweh and to teach them how you overcome. You know, so our overcoming is a part of the teaching that we will be doing. Now, because we have done Yahweh's will, okay, and what is the will of Yahweh? You know, to keep, to keep his laws, to follow in, in complete 100% obedience. You know, as we've seen in, in various um, examples in Scripture, how the men of old, the righteous men of old, you know, followed and found reverence and honor and regard in Yahweh in His eyes and before His sight at His house by keeping His laws, obeying the voice of Yahweh, the one Yahweh sent to teach and to guide them. You know, we've been given the same opportunity in these last days. You know, it's, it's almost... Uh, mind-boggling when you think of the opportunity that we have in these last days to actually be a part of what we see written in the scriptures, you know, because when you read the scriptures, you kind of think, you know, man, that must have been something to live in the times of, of Noah or Moshe or Abraham or Yeshua, you know, but we're actually living in this amazing time period that's going to be spoken of for all eternity, you know, this last generation, this seventh work, this seventh era. Now, because we've done Yahweh's will, we will be sent to teach the nations and the universe. You know, and as we just read in the fourth book of years, we're there to teach them Yahweh's laws. Not to teach them rebellion or disobedience, but to teach them Yahweh's laws. Obedience, strict adherence to the every word of Yahweh. We're going to be sent to teach them how to live by the every word of Yahweh and how to overcome. You know, because just as we were pulled out of sin, you know, the, the whole world is still engulfed and wrapped up in this, in this um, abundance of sin and the wickedness. You know, in the universe, we can't, we can't see all the defilement of the universe, but even science sees, you know, through the telescopes and the different studies they do of, of the universe that there's problems in the universe where you have things out of order, you know, things smashing into other things, whether it's comets or asteroids smashing into each other or smashing into planets, you know, things are out of order. And as pastor showed us, this whole universe is needing the sons and daughters of Yahweh to be able to teach them, to guide them, to live by Yahweh's laws and how to overcome the problems they're having. Now, teaching others, of course, is one of the hardest jobs. You know, you hear about hard jobs. You know, people speak about hard jobs as if it's, if it's um, something that's labor intensive or working in the heat or getting real dirty. But really, teaching others is one of the hardest jobs. You know, and this is the job that Yahweh gave to his servant Israel is to teach the called out ones in these last days. You and I, you know, the ones Yahweh has brought to this house to be taught, to be trained, to be perfected. Yahweh has been trying and refining us so that we can handle this great responsibility. So we would also be able to go and to teach others. You know, it, it'd be no benefit, no benefit for us to just learn righteousness, learn Yahweh's laws, and not to be able to spread that forth to others. You know, it should come forth in our examples and our words and our actions. And it's, it's, a, it's a blessing that we have. We have the great blessing to have the greatest teaching curriculum ever offered to man. You know, we're going to be able to take these books of years throughout the universe with us to teach from. If you turn to Psalms chapter 19... 
Psalms chapter 19, verse 7 through 9. And I'm going to be reading it out of the 12th book of Israel. Psalms 19, 7 through 9. And I'll be going over it here from the 12th book of Israel along with one of the verses here Pastor covers. 12th book of Israel, part 1, chapter 28, on page 257. Now in Psalms 19, verse 7, it says, The laws of Yahweh are perfect, converting the whole person. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making the simple ones wise. The statutes of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of Yahweh are pure, bringing understanding to the eyes. You know, true rejoicing comes to the heart from Yahweh's statutes. You know, um, the excitement that the world finds, you know, in sin or in pleasure seeking, those things are temporary. You know, no one, no one finds true rejoicing in their heart. You know, it's, it's a continual searching, as the scripture says, the pleasures of sin or the pleasures of Egypt for a moment. It's momentary. It's not lasting. It's not forever. In Psalms 19, verse 9, it says, The reverence of Yahweh is clean. And Pastor says here in the 12th book of Israel, chapter 28, this is the 12th book of Israel, part 1, chapter 28, and verse 64, he says, I don't know why anyone in the house of Yahweh wouldn't reverence Yahweh. It's just beyond me that they would not glorify that being day and night, waking up, thinking about him, go to bed, thinking about him, and what he's trying to do to a bunch of wicked sinners, praise Yahweh. You know, and this is us. We, we were the wicked sinners that Yahweh pulled out of this world through pastor to be able to be trained and turn from this sin, that we'd be able to overcome these sins and to become perfect and just in Yahweh's sight. Now, only, only a small remnant, we only see a small remnant in these last days pulled out of this wickedness. You know, the majority of the world, the majority of the world, billions of people are still caught up in this wickedness, you know, and it's, it's, it's no fault of their own. They have no, they have no righteous teacher, you know, and, and, and the teachers they have teach lies and deception, confusion and war, hatred and defilement. Now, Yahweh called us out of those things. He brought us to his servant Israel, you know, he called us out through his servant Israel and brought us to his ser- servant Israel to have open ears and open eyes to be able to hear this message that Pastor is bringing. If you go over to Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 15, on page 881, you know, it's, 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 it's no wonder it's spoken and prophesied that this last day's work is going to be the greatest ever, you know, the last will be first, it's going to be spoken of throughout all eternity as the greatest ever, because this is a huge job and a huge responsibility that's been given to pastor in these last days of bringing out these wicked sinners and converting them to righteousness through Yahweh's laws and turning them into the holiest of the holy people, righteous teachers who can go forth and teach the universe. In Romans chapter 10, in verse 14, It says, how then can they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher or a teacher? And how can they preach or teach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the message of peace, who bring glad tidings of righteous things. Okay, and and we brothers and sisters are are a small portion of, of the earth's inhabitants that actually can hear this message of peace coming forth from Yahweh's servant, Israel. Okay, the rest of the world, you can see it on the news daily. You can read about it. They're caught up in the confusion, the war, or their entertainment. You know, and it's, it's a continual, as Pastor described it, you know, a dog chasing its tail just round and round and round again. There's no change in society. If you look here in side note H from Romans 10.15... This is from uh, the word sent, unless they are sent. Side note H says, set apart. It usually denotes separation, departures, cessation, completion, reversal, etc. To order one to fulfill a commission. Okay, so Yisrael Abel Hawkins, the one Yahweh sent in these last days to bring forth the holiest of the holies, is fulfilling his commission. You know, and he's spreading 
that, that knowledge and that wisdom to us. He's pouring it out to us week by week, you know, uh, day by day, sermon by sermon, letter by letter, newsletter, prophetic word, you know, all the various forms of, of um, preaching and publishing that he uses to get this message to us so that we would be able to go, so that we'd be able to take hold, take hold of this message qualify for this position, and then we would be the ones that would be able to be sent out to the nations in the universe to teach. In the fifth book of Israel, sorry, I have a bunch of different books here, but in the fifth book of Israel, chapter 25, in verse 55, Pastor talked here a little bit about this sending out that we will have. Fifth book of Israel, chapter 25, verse 55, he says, the ones Yahweh made, you being the remnant of the great kingdom of Yahweh, you know, we're, we're the remnant of this great kingdom, are going to clean up the earth. Then we'll be sent to the universe to clean it up and teach the beings. You know, and it's, it's, it's a large job, you know, where we're going to have to clean up, you know, 6,000 years of defilement, you know, in one-sixth the time. You know, the work Yahweh is always about hurry, hurry, work, work, Right? That's why the whole universe is so expectant of Yahweh to perform this great plan of His. They're waiting on it now and rejoicing. Every time they see us, make a move towards righteous behavior. Okay, you can see, as Pastor described it once, as, as these heavenly beings are watching us, you know, on the sea of glass like a television, like you would watch a television. They're watching us and they're rejoicing every time they see us make a move towards righteous behavior. They know that we're actually fulfilling the plan that Yahweh has told them about. He witnesses this to the gods. Okay, and then he, he shows them in Genesis 3 and verse 5 about mankind being given this rulership. We'll be turning over to Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 5, found on page 531. So Yahweh witnesses to his soon-to-be anointed sons, sons and daughters that will be teaching the universe, you know, and he, he brags on us, you know, he brags on us as, as we read of the example in Eob where he, you know, bragged on Eob and he lifted him up, you know, uh, have, you seen, have you seen my servant Eob? In Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 5, it says, the people will be oppressed, everyone by another and everyone by his neighbor. The child will be insolent toward the ancient and the base toward the honorable. Okay, and this is the oppression that we're seeing on the earth today. You know, this, this is um, a part of what Yeshua prophesied in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 7, where nation will be against nation, kingdom against kingdom. You see children against their parents, you know, parents against the grandparents. You see uh, states against states and, and uh, counties against governments and governors. You know, you can see how the people in every aspect, there's not, any, there's not any part of the earth where you don't see this oppression that's come from a lack of righteous teachers, a lack of righteousness being taught. Yeshua showed in Matthew chapter 24, if you remember Matthew 24, verses 37 through 39, you can just write it down for your notes, we're not going to go there, but he showed how the last days would be just as the days of Noah were. You know, how men would be lovers of themselves and how there would be this, this uh, wickedness as we saw in, in Genesis, if you turn over to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, we'll take a look quickly just how the days of Noah were. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, and this is what we see amongst mankind today because of a lack of righteous teachers. Remember, um, of course, beginning with Abel, but even down through, through time periods that Yahweh gave them opportunities to repent all the way, even up until Samuel, that the people chose to reject the righteous teachers. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, it says, Then Yahweh saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. Not kind of evil, not partially evil, only evil continually, which is what we see on the earth today, where it's continual war, fighting, vengeance, and retaliation. You know, you can see the world groaning and, and, and 
uh, desiring to have righteous teachers, to have those sent to them to lead and guide them out of those uh, sins, you know, because with, without having instructions, you know, you just have ideas, you know, you have your own thoughts, but you have no, you have no roadmap to success, you know, because you don't have the instructions, you know, it's like, it's like trying to find some place, you know, and then of course, you know, now everyone uses GPS or back in the days maps, but if you were just told to go find some place and you had no instructions on how to find that place, you would just drive around or walk around or fly around in circles and you wouldn't be able to find that place. You know, you have to have instructions. And, and, and so in order to have instructions, you have to have instructors, teachers, guides, lead, leaders, one cent. You know, this is what pastor's been training us to do, to be these one cent to the universe. In the ninth book, Israel, part two, chapter 98 and verse 31, we can see why we're such a blessed people here. Ninth book of Israel, part two, chapter 18 and verse 31. Pastor says, when I say Yahweh bless you, I don't mean that Yahweh give you a bunch of wealth and this red scarlet coloring, gold mansions to live in and so forth. If I prayed for anything at all physically, I'd pray that Yahweh tries you, gives you a handful of trials, praise Yahweh. And then I'd prove or I would pray that you endure through those trials so you have a place in the kingdom with me forever. That would be my prayer, praise Yahweh. So pastor's prayer for us, his prayer for us is to be tried, to be tested, to be purified, you know, so that we can go forth as being these one sent, these righteous teachers. Now this past week there was a uh, message that came forth from pastor from the one sent Yahweh's branch. I'm just going to read this message here. Quickly, it, um, I believe it came out on second day morning. It says, we're still on trial even though we passed the two-day test with glory in the highest and glory to the saints who passed it. The greatest, okay, so the greatest test is yet to come, and it could come today. But the great and honorable Yeshua Messiah said, your test will come at a time when you least expect it. Remember, Yeshua told us to be on guard. Be on guard so that no man deceives us. You know, be on guard because these tests are going to come up day by day. And as we build towards Yahweh's kingdom being ushered in and being given rulership over the earth, the tests will increase. The trials will increase. I, the branch pastor says, believe that your biggest test is going to come from me. Hmm, pastor's going to test us, huh? Try us? It's going to come from me, the branch, and Yeshua, the most honorable high priest, and the greatest creator, most high father of all, the one most rejected by man, the gods, his wives, and sons and daughters, the one who has never stopped a hobbing, the mighty father of all, Yahweh, who is also the greatest and highest priest of all, Yahweh Hawkins, the greatest and most zealous priest. Okay, so we can see that pastor is asking Yahweh to try us, to test us, to prove us, you know, to, to give us the opportunity to qualify, to be these ones sent, to help uh, bring the earth and the universe back to this glory that Yahweh created it. Now we here in the house of Yahweh, you know, through the many days or years, depending on how long we've been here, you know, we've been able to witness, to witness and to see many things taking place in the work of Yahweh and, and um, you know, through the different prophecies being fulfilled. And we've been able to, to learn from these things. You know, t- typically every time we see prophecy being fulfilled, it's another opportunity for us to be tested or tried. Now, in the 18th book of Israel, 18th book of Israel, chapter 20 and verse 22, Pastor talks here, about, you know, taking us, the wicked sinners that we read about earlier, taking us and using us for this great job, this great job that Yahweh has for His sons and daughters to be the one sent to bring peace, to bring the the message of overcoming, the instructions on how to overcome sin, how to overcome faults and flaws. In the 18th book of Israel, chapter 20, verse 22, he says, We fought it here. When the house of Yahweh started coming out of the world, we fought it. We fought it hard. I said, we're going to clean this mess up. And he was talking about the various sins that we see in the world that the world's just totally burdened down with. 
I said, pastor says, I said, we're going to clean this mess up and we're going to make holy people out of unholy people. And that's what we have done. We've got a super gang here and Yahweh has identified us all to tag numbers on vans. Okay, so what we were, the unholy people when we were called, Yahweh has brought us here so that pastor would be able to make holy people out of us to, through these trials and these tests, through the instructions, through the teachings. In closing here in the fifth book of Israel, well, I have two more quotes in closing, but in the fifth book of Israel, chapter 16 and verse 85, Pastor says, and he was, he was talking to someone who had called him for confessions, and they, they, were, uh, they weren't as joyful as they should be. He said, I, he said, think about what Yahweh has called you for. Think about this great kingdom of heaven that he has offered you, where you can actually get rid of all this garbage. Yahweh actually shows that. He shows that when we're finished, we're going to have these things confined and these parasites confined. You know, so we can see sometimes we might find ourselves uh, not as joyful as we want to be feeling, you know, and, and, and not as excited about doing the job or, or going through the test as we should be. You know, and some of these things are, are beyond our control because of, you know, various sins of our forefathers or the defilement of the earth. But think about the fact that one day Yahweh is going to bring us through these things. We're going to have actually control over the microbes. You know, we're not going to have pain and suffering and affliction and, and uh, torment no more. And also in the fifth book of Israel, chapter 14, in verse 38 and 39, Pastor says, Yahweh says he will establish you. That's the same thing he's saying here. He's establishing you as a people who uphold these laws. That's a holy people. You, brethren, will be sent out to the universe as representatives of Yahweh. All the beings throughout the universe know Yahweh. They know what he stands for, but they're like the people here on earth and have to go downhill before they ever realize they've done something wrong and need to make a change. The beings throughout the universe are watching everything we're doing right now. They're watching you closely and greatly anticipating whether what Yahweh has planned will come true or not. Yahweh says it will. You know, let Yahweh be true and every man a liar, right? Yahweh says it will. Satan says it won't. I believe Yahweh can bring this thing about. Yeshua said, unless heaven and earth passed away, this plan would not pass away. I don't think Satan can destroy the heavens and the earth. Now you can see, you can see Satan trying, but she doesn't have this ability to destroy the heavens and the earth. And the final quote I had was in the first book of Israel, chapter 2, and verse 72. Pastor says, you have become so different from what you were when you first came here. You were far from being righteous or holy. You didn't get it overnight. You got it over several years of teaching and counseling and Yahweh leading you into different blunders, headaches, and sufferings. You were willing to give it up, every one of you, willing to give up all those different blunders, headaches, and suffering, all, all those different things, that, those, those sins that you might have been hanging on to. We were willing to give those things up. You were willing to give it up, every one of you. Now, I don't think Satan can throw anything at you that you can't take with a grain of salt and go right on. I don't think there's any way she can get you to quit. This is my hope. So we can see that pastors invested you know, all his time, resources, and energy and to training us to be the one sent, to be sent out to teach and to guide and to lead all of Yahweh's creation into peace, joy, and abundant living. Let's all be responsible in our, our efforts and our, and our trials day by day to continue to hold up the witness usual, Yahweh's chosen branch, the one who comes in the name of Yahweh. And at this time, if you all please stand. Yahweh bless your understanding. May the peace of Yahweh be with each and every one of you. I now have the opportunity to turn it over to the great Kohan, David DePass. Shabbat Shalom. Please be seated. It's a great honor to come before the great called out ones of Yahweh. Now, 
<laughs> if there are any Christians in the viewing audience, I ask that you pay close attention to this message. I am particularly em empathetic to Christians who are sincere and really do strive Oh, let me take this off. I think this is kind of muffling. Uh, as I said, who are sincere and really do strive to do what they think their Bibles are telling them to do. And um, I think you, you can all appreciate that. I think that most of the adults who... Who, people who are called as adults to the house of Yahweh probably came from, most likely came from Christianity. <clears throat> now we're doing our best to, to, um, to help you understand this message. And we do recognize that one of the biggest obstacles to understanding this message of the kingdom is the carnal mind. Now, one reason why this is such an obstacle and why people don't realize that they are being hindered by the carnal mind is that Christian preachers call the carnal mind so by, by a name that you wouldn't recognize, okay? Um, that is a highly respected name. Now, what we want to do is to expose this kind of trick, so to speak, and show you exactly how this took place. But we want to show you also and give you a lesson on the carnal mind itself so you will understand. Now, without telling you what this name is that the Christian preachers use to label the work of the carnal mind with, we want to just tell you what the carnal mind does. Okay? And the idea behind that is a rose is still a rose regardless of what you call it. If you, if you call it something else, it's still a rose. Likewise, the carnal mind is still the carnal mind, even if your minister calls it the most exalted name in Christianity. So here's what the carnal mind does. And I think everybody could pretty much say it with me. <laughs> the carnal mind opposes Yahweh's laws. Okay? Let's say that again. It's pretty simple. The carnal mind opposes Yahweh's laws. I don't think our friends in Christianity really thought about that statement. But it's clearly written in Scripture. If you turn to Romans 8 verse, and we're going to read two verses. It's on page 879. It says, Because the carnal mind is enmity, against bitterly opposed, bitterly opposed to Yahweh. For it is not subject, and this is how it's bitterly opposed to Yahweh, for it is not subject to the law of Yahweh, nor indeed can be. It cannot be. And, you know, when you read the scriptures and it says, that the tree of righteousness cannot lead you wrong. And then it says the churches, they cannot lead you right. This is the basis of it. But in practical sense, in practical terms, what does this mean? What, what does it mean? Well, I want to demonstrate quickly here um, can you 
Okay. Oh, we have some scriptures here. I'm not ready for that one yet. So let's show this one. Okay. So it says, this is Romans um, 2 verse 13. Look at what it says here. It says it clearly. Okay. For not the hearers of the law are just before Yahweh. Or be, this is from the King James Version, by the way. I just want to, um, because I'm trying to get the attention of our Christian friends, okay? I'm using the King James Version in, these, in this instance here. For not the hearers of the law are just before Yahweh. We, we're going to substitute Yahweh. This is the house of Yahweh. But the doers of the law shall be justified. It's very clear. This is a statement in support of the laws of Yahweh. Now, what does a person who is being powered by the carnal mind, what they would do with that scripture? Well, I know Christians and I know that they, would, they know that in the scriptures it says, um, uh, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. So, here a little and there a little. Hold on. Let's say, hold on. Okay. Go to Romans 3, verse 20. And it says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. See? See? No flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Okay. Let's, let's put that aside one moment. We're going to get back to it. The, the carnal mind is always seeking to go around Yahweh's laws. Not to accept Yahweh's laws. To do away with it. Okay? And this is the signature um, uh, action or the signature essence of the carnal mind. Okay? But what did someone with the spirit of Yahweh do when they saw that scripture? Does he say, oh, oh well, okay. Does he, does, he, does he go along with being an opposition to Yahweh's law? No. And this is how you will know that the world does not have Yahweh's spirit holy or Yahweh's holy spirit. Okay? Because they willingly go along with the works produced by the carnal mind, to influence of the carnal mind. What, what, what did our, our pastor, the Yahweh's witness, Yahweh's servant in these last days do when, when he saw Romans 3 verse 20 in the King James Version? He went further. He went to investigate because he's not opposed to Yahweh's laws. You see, now let's see if you can see this. This is um, a interlinear. It's um, scriptures for all with like the number four, and you could they have um, uh, the the second volume, the New Testament, um, all in. Um, an interlinear. So here we are looking at Romans 3. You see it right there? Romans 3, right? So let's go look for Romans 3, verse 20. And this is Romans 3, verse 20. You see it right there? Let, let's see if we can get this bigger. Romans 3, verse 20. And I want you to notice... a. Uh, 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 a Greek word, E-X, right there. And notice what it means, out. Okay? This, this word was not translated in this verse. And, you know, when I do studies, I would go on um, Bible Gateway or Bible Hub or what have you, and you, would, you, can, you, can, you can reference and see that verse in all the versions that they have. And they have a whole lot of versions 
translations. And none of them got this right. None of them had um, translated this word here in, in, into English. But guess who did? <laughs> guess who did? Let's read what we have in the book of Yahweh. Because anyone who does anything outside of the law. You see, it, 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 it's, it's translated here. If you do anything outside of the law, will not be justified before him, for through the law comes full knowledge of sin. Of course you want to know what is sin. Okay? That you don't do it. That's the idea. And there are several scriptures like that. And we have to really be empathetic to the Christians because that's what they see there. You see? And they don't have the strength there because Yahweh's spirit is not there. Now, they might feel that they have the spirit. They have the Holy Ghost. Okay? And... But these are the facts, right? The, these are the facts, and this is how the facts um, um, play it. And you can find easily in Scripture, go to 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, and see here um, other Scripture by the same author, by the way, who wrote Romans. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, it says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of Yahweh? The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of Yahweh. Do not deceive yourselves. I want you to notice this. That deception, the criteria for deception, is law-keeping. Whether you keep the law or not. The, the, the criteria is based on law. That's how we're going to make the assessment. And notice this. Do not deceive yourself. Neither fornicators nor God worshippers. In the King James it says idolaters. Well, the, idol, I, I, the idolaters, they worship gods. Okay? Um, or adulterers nor men who commit sexual perversions with boys nor men who commit sexual perversions with other men, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, extortioners, will inherit the kingdom of Yahweh. You see that? No, this is serious. I'm, and I'm pointing it out to my Christian friends. This is serious. This is a serious criteria here. So we're going to, delve into the carnal mind because we all need to know this. Okay? Today we're going to see why Yahweh made us with the carnal mind that opposes His laws. Why? But before we get really into it, I want to just draw a little bit more contrast to this, to... to A little more contrast to Yahweh's spirit. Let's put that over there. Okay? And um, so, Yachanan or John 6, verse 30, 60, 63 tells us, talking about the spirit now, which is the counter. Um, the, the, um, the, the opposite, so to speak, of the carnal mind. Okay? So this is something important for my Christian friends to hold on to here because um, they often focus on that they have the Holy Spirit. They have the Holy Ghost, as they say. We don't have a ghost. Okay? Um, but notice what, if you say you have Holy Spirit, Look at what Holy Spirit is. It says, it is the Spirit that gives life. 
And I believe they would agree with that. Okay? The flesh is useless. The laws that I speak to you, they are spirit. And they are life everlasting. So the spirit of Yahweh is in agreement with the laws of Yahweh. That's what it's saying. It's in agreement with the laws of Yahweh. And just as I demonstrated here with Romans 2 verse 13, Romans 3 verse 20. Okay? In Romans 7 verse 14 it says, For we know that the law is spiritual. The law is spiritual. But notice this part of it now. He says, But I was carnal. You see the distinction? Sold under the power of sin. That's when he was dragging the believers out. Okay? He grew up knowing and being taught the laws of Yahweh. But he was going against it. You see? And he's like he didn't have the, the strength to, 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 to do opposite. He was going after. The, the laws that he was, he was brought up with, though, was a mixture of traditions. You see? But he, he recognized the laws. But then he, he, there was a struggle there. Right? So through those period of time when he was after the, the believers, this was what was going on, the anguish that was going on in his mind. In 1 Corinthians 2, um, 2 verse 11, it says, For what man understands what, for what man understands what passes through a man's thoughts except the man's own spirit. The man's own spirit, that's the carnal mind. In the same way, no one understands the things of Yahweh. What are the things of Yahweh? His laws and his plans. Those are his things. Okay? What he plans to do. Except the spirit of Yahweh. You can't know these things except that you have the spirit here of Yahweh. So, <clears throat> we're going to go through this exercise here just to make it clear so that you can understand and you can identify the carnal mind anytime it argues against keeping Yahweh's laws. Oh, let, 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 a, let an alert come up on your, on your mind. Oh, carnal mind. Okay, anytime it's something that is, is uh, opposing Yahweh's laws, you're going to say, er, er. You know, that something comes up over your head or something. You could say the carnal mind is a car that Satan drives. You see? But Holy Spirit is, is, is the counterpart to the carnal mind. And it is directed by Yahweh to lead you into all truth. Okay? Or laws of Yahweh. Right? And the truth is defined in... Uh, Psalms 119 verses 142 and 151. It's, de it's defined. When you get a definition from Scripture, there is no higher authority. You don't need to go to Strong's or anything. Okay? When you get a definition from Scripture, it's coming from Yahweh Himself. Okay? So, truth it's talking about Yahweh's laws. Um, so, the carnal mind also uh, called the flesh obeys the law of sin. Okay, and Yahweh's Holy Spirit is like the is like a character of a, a character of one who believes in the plan of Yahweh and the laws of Yahweh, the covenant that Yahweh is calling you to enter. With him is for us to allow him to write his laws in our hearts and in our minds. So by, um, by us freely, by us freely choosing to keep his laws while denying our carnal lust and overcoming our carnal minds. You see, though that, come, that, that occurs at the same time. Okay, now, we were all born with the carnal mind. All of us. Okay. And that was by design. Yahweh 
did not make a mistake or something um, uh, uh, that Yahweh forgot, okay, to, to remove from us. And I had something here, I, I, didn't, I didn't bring it, but you know, you know, surgeons, they leave all kind of things inside people. I, I, had, a, I had an article saying that one, one surgeon was accused of leaving his phone inside of a woman. So, but Yahweh did not make a mistake here, okay? Um, the, uh, although the carnal mind opposes Yahweh's laws, the carnal mind is pretty sophisticated. It's pretty sophisticated, okay? It provides humans with some important features, such as the instinct of self-preservation. It's important. Um, Self-preservation. Free moral agency. I have a... Where are my things? Okay. That's what I should put up there as we go. Okay. Free moral agency and our desires are lust. So these are the three components, if you will, of the carnal mind. So while these components are selfish and self-serving self in nature, without them, we, could, we would probably be dead by now. Okay? The, uh, the, an analysis of these um, three components of the carnal mind will give us a better understanding of why the carnal mind opposes Yahweh's laws. So let's start out with self-preservation. Generally, older children and adults possesses, um, possess a sense of self-preservation, okay? But babies and younger children, they don't understand danger. This is why um, we'll stop at a stoplight and, and not drink poison or what have you, unless this sense of self-preservation has become um, uh, impaired. And you could impair it with drugs, you could impair it with um, depression, uh, you know, anything, for example, that would cause a person to go and take their own life, okay? You're, you're um, impairing this, this sense, so to speak. Now, a righteous, a righteous person can override uh, this sense of self-preservation. But you could see right there, there there's going to be a resistance, you see that? Okay? But a righteous person can override this sense of preservation. And why would you want to do that? Why would you want to do that? Well, think law again. In the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they overrode this sense in, of the carnal mind. Okay? Because they weren't about to, to break Yahweh's law. So they chose to overrule their carnal mind sense of self-preservation and choose to be burnt up. That's what the choice was laid out uh, to them. Instead of breaking Yahweh's law by bowing down to the idol. Okay? There, there are going to be times, brethren, and I think thoughts have been going through a lot of people's minds with all of what's going on in the world today. In the United States, um, it's like a setup. It's like a setup is going on to bring about a racial war. It's like a setup, and it's 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 like it's being purposely done somehow. It's just like, you know, everything is gearing towards it. And I'm. It's like I always ask, what does the worst time of trouble look like? And I'm beginning to see it. Okay, and remember this though. Remember this. It, it, we have to prepare ourselves. We cannot just wait to make the right decision. We have to prepare our minds, you know, that we can choose to give it up like, like Yeshua. Okay? But in Matthew 10, verse 23, 28, notice what it says there. And I don't have a page number for you. It says, and do not fear those who kill the body but are not able to kill the spirit. In the King James, it says the, the soul. 
but rather fear him who is able to destroy both spirit and, and body in Gehenna. This needs to be clear in our minds, brethren, what we would do if, if, if we are ever in a situation like this. Yeshua Messiah is the one who gave this instruction and he followed his own inst instruction, okay? He's our example. My Christian friends, you would agree with that, that Yeshua is your example? Notice what it says there in First Yachanan. I know time is something that usually goes too fast. But um, in Yachanan, it says in verse 6, He who says I, he abides in him is, is himself also obligated to walk exactly as he walked. Exactly as he walked. Did he sin? Did he sin? No. Sin, he would have to break Yahweh's laws to sin. But that's the, that's the pattern. That's the example that was given to us. So, before his time came to be killed, he escaped from the hands of the Pharisees many times. But when, he, when his time came and when he knew that his time came, he, sub, he submitted. He submitted. Okay? He did ask. Yes, um, if this cup can be removed from him, he did. But he said, what did he say? But not my will, your will. You see? So, next, next component here, free moral agency. Now, self-preservation is a specific application of free moral agency. It deserves its own category. Because it involves allowing yourself, choosing to allow yourself to be hurt. Okay? For the keeping of Yahweh's laws. But free moral agency is our ability to choose. And if you want to turn here really quick, Deuteronomy 30 verse 15. Yahweh knew, Yahweh wouldn't have written this here, or, or um, inspired this to be written, unless we could choose. Okay? We have to, be, we have to willingly um, choose to, to, to perform Yahweh's laws and deny self all at the same time. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 15, it says, See, I have set before you this day life by righteousness and death and destruction. And this is being set before us every Sabbath. My friends in Christianity, it's being set before you every Sabbath at the house of Yahweh. Okay? You're not getting this choice out there. It's, either, it's a choice on how to die. Okay? It's not, there's never a choice given in the world on life, even though they say it. Okay? Verse 16. In that I command you this day to love Yahweh Ahab Yahweh, your father, by walking in all his ways, by keeping his laws, his statutes, and his judgments, so that you will live and multiply. And so Yahweh, your father, will bless you in the land which you go over to possess, which, which is the kingdom for us. In verse um, 19, I said, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses, because you are free agents to make your own choice between righteousness and evil. Therefore, choose life so both you and your children will live. There's no doubt about it. Yahweh knows that, you know, it can't be done by force. That's not how he's doing it. He's, he, he can't be done by force. But the way mankind thinks, this is all mankind thinks, okay? Um, uh, Yahweh don't exist, okay? Look, he don't exist. You don't, you don't have to worry about Yahweh. Look, I, I'm breaking the law, <laughs> okay? The, the, the carnal mind, the way the carnal mind thinks is if, if somebody's not going to slap me over the head, I ain't going to do it, 
right? So there's a little deception there. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so don't be deceived. Don't let the, the, the carnal mind deceive. It says, So, um, so let me ask you, you know, since Yahweh give us this choice, how has the world been doing? Did the, did the world choose righteousness? Did the world choose righteousness? That's not what the scripture says. Read it in Revelation 12, verse 9. King James Version. King James Version. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived that, that, that word again. Remember what I said? The criteria for deception is whether or not you keep the law. OK, so Satan here is deceiving the whole world. It says the whole world. He has cast out and he was cast out. In there. But the point is, Satan has deceived the whole world. Now, my Christian friends. The whole world include. A few billion people. And you know what it says here? It says that Christians remain the world's largest religious group, but they are declining in Europe. If this scripture is true, Revelation 12 verse 9, and 2.3 billion people of the people in the world are Christians. Can you see that Christians would have to be deceived as a block? I'm not just talking about one a little bit. No, as a, as a block. There's no other way to, con to, 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 to see this. Anyways, time is running out. Um, uh, the next component is our desires. Turn to Genesis 6, Genesis 4. Our choices are governed by our desires. The carnal mind is the seat of our desires and our natural desires are generally, now generally, our natural desires are generally, not always, but generally sinful or opposed to Yahweh's laws. Okay? You know, every man that walks out there and ends up lost in, understand what I mean. Okay? And you have to practice Yahweh's law in order not to fulfill your lust. You see? So without teaching from a servant of Yahweh, we are more inclined to follow after our sinful lust. You see? In Genesis 4 verse 7, and this is from the King James Version again, I'm reading here. It says, for you do, in the King James, it says, for you do well. Actually, no, book of Yahweh. I'm reading from the book of Yahweh, but I did note what the King James said. It said, if you do well, in the book of Yahweh, it says, if you do righteousness. Now think about those two, this two, two things right there. If you do well, what is that? What is it? Well. It can be anything. It's not specific. You see that? It's not helping you. But if you do righteousness, and righteousness is defined, it's defined in Deuteronomy 6, verse 25, okay? As us keeping Yahweh's laws. See, it all comes back down to that. It's simple. It's not that hard. It's simple, okay? If you do righteousness, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do righteousness, in other words, if you're thinking of doing unrighteousness, sin is crouching at your door. Notice what it says next. The desire to sin is with you. When you go to the mall, it is with you. Wherever you go, it is with you. You see that? And Yahweh made it such that it's with you. Because in order to put his desires in you, you're going to have to refuse yours. You see? He, Yahweh is making sure that nobody gets into the kingdom 
except by their choice. That's what he's doing. So opposing Yahweh's laws is, is ingrained in our psyche. Uh, okay, great. <laughs> okay, it's, it's ingrained in our psyche. Okay. Um, and notice there, I'm going to give you the definition of sin now because I don't think I did it before. Um, but everybody here knows it, right? It's all A students over here. Um, first, Yakanan 3 verse 4. Whosoever sins, this is what you do, you transgress the law. That is clear. No, I never met a Christian who says it's okay to sin. I've never met one. They, all, they, they always say, yeah, you shouldn't sin. Well, if you sin, what are you doing? You're breaking Yahweh's laws. Okay, keep that in mind. For sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifest to take away your sin. No, I'm sort of giving away the name that they use here. Okay, to, to, to um, call Yeshua. Because um, in verse 5, um, in, in verse 5, um, it's, it talk about he who manif he was manifest to take away our sins. So you see, you know, this is how slick Satan is, though. Um, but it says there's two ways to take away sins. There's two ways, right? Either you take away the law, okay? You can take away the law, or um, you can obey the law. Okay? Which one do you think the carnal mind is going to do? Take away the law. Do away with it. Okay? Do away with it. So, this is what um, uh, has occurred. I got to move on here. Um, so, you know, a lot of people come to the house of Yahweh and and they come and they get baptized, right? And they learn about the carnal mind and everything. Call about what I said. And they think, man, I got this thing beat. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm righteous. I'm perfect right now. Okay, I got this thing beat. Only to realize that the carnal mind, it don't go easy. Okay? The carnal mind survived baptism. Okay? It's like a garden weed that keeps coming back. You know, this is why we must overcome the carnal mind like Yeshua did. Now, I did miss a point that I wanted to say, and I want to say it. Hebrews 4 verse 15 shows that Yeshua was tempted but did not sin. The fact that he was tempted means that he has desires. You see? The desire is like the, is like the, is like the um, grasshopper on the hook or the worm on the hook. And, and, you, and you, you, you going around it, you're the fish going around it. Now, if you snap, you got caught. Okay? But you can, you can do like what Yeshua did. He never snapped. All right? Okay. But Christian preachers, Christian preachers, listen now. This is important. I don't see nobody. Um, uh, okay? Christian preachers teach that the carnal mind is gone at baptism. And guess who enters? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ enters in the person's heart so they are able to automatically live righteous. Automatically live righteous. Tell me, tell me if that, that's, not, that's, not, that's not what they, they teach. They are saved at that very moment of baptism. But I want you to notice something here. Don't miss this. Isn't Jesus Christ the one that Christian preachers claim did away with the laws? Who do we know do away with laws or try to oppose laws? Who do we know? The carnal mind. They don't realize, brethren, that the Jesus Christ is the personification of the carnal mind on steroids. <laughs> That's what Jesus Christ is. And I want to point that out. And I'm not being sarcastic or anything like that. This is the facts. This is the truth. And they're taking away eternal life from you. The whole world. Look at the whole world. If they're not like, they're okay, they might not be all Christians, but in one way or the other, they're doing away with Yahweh's laws. They don't keep Yahweh's laws. That's the common thread 
that comes be, 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 uh, over every, everybody in the world. That's why the world is deceived. Brethren, all of Christianity got played. Three card Monty. Okay? They think that they're getting the king of righteousness. But that's not what they got. They got the queen of hearts. That's what they got. They didn't get the king of righteousness. The king of righteousness is in the house of Yahweh. So, that's the value of knowing and understanding the carnal mind, brethren. What is the carnal mind? The carnal mind opposes Yahweh's laws. Don't forget it. Don't, don't, don't participate. Overcome it, brethren. So with that, I pray that Yahweh bless your understanding. Woo, woo, woo. A lot of things here to pick up. And I'll turn it over for closing prayer. If you all raise your hands. Heavenly Father Yahweh, this is Deacon Tobiah. Come to the Father Deacon Benjamin from the body of Khans. We pass your shock and your shame aside. I thank you for the Sabbath that you've blessed us with, um, that we can come meet together and learn. Please help us to take to heart everything we've learned today. Please bless the food and drink that we're about to partake of. Please bless Pastor with the full use of his subconscious mind connection. Please release the kind you need from prison. Please make us so you want us to be, because that's how you want to be. And please um, guide and inspire us every single day and all these things to Yashim Sai's name. Hell yeah, I praise y'all.